Good morning. Whether you are a longtime member, a new member, or a visitor, we want to welcome you to the online service at Bedford United Church. We are so pleased that you could join us. Our church is an affirming church which believes in dignity, respect, and justice. We start each service by the lighting of two candles, the Christ candle and the inclusivity candle. Please join us as we light the Christ candle. God is here. All the time. All the time. God is here. And the inclusivity candle. All are welcome. All the time. All the time. All are welcome. As you can see, I'm not the only one that wants to be on camera today. <laughs> happy end of August, friends. It's, I'm so happy to be here with you officially as your music minister. Uh, I can't believe I'm actually saying that out loud for the first time to all of you. Uh, it's been a long time coming and I'm very excited and very happy to be with you today. Um, Sometime in the future, I'll share with you my journey and what brought me to BUC, how the Spirit led me here. But in the meantime, we're here to worship this morning, and um, the songs I've selected are all about trusting God. And in this time of pandemic, we definitely need to do that. We need to trust God and know uh, that everything's under control. So open your minds, your hearts, your spirit. And uh, just listen to what the Spirit might have to say to you this morning. Be blessed. Jesus came bringing us hope. Jesus came bringing us hope. Jesus came bringing us hope. Hallelujah forevermore. Jesus came bringing us hope. Jesus came bringing us hope. Jesus came bringing us hope. Hallelujah forevermore. Joy. Jesus came bringing us joy. Jesus came bringing us joy. Jesus came bringing us joy. Hallelujah forevermore. Sing love. Jesus came bringing us love. Jesus came bringing us love. Jesus came bringing us love. Hallelujah forevermore love. Jesus came bringing us love. Jesus came bringing us love. Jesus came bringing us love. Hallelujah forevermore. Hallelujah. outside the lines exploring paths that few could ever find it takes me into places where I've never been before and opens doors to worlds outside the lines my God colors outside the lines Turns wounds to blessings, water into wine, and takes me into places where I've never been before, and opens doors to worlds outside the line. We'll never walk on water if we're not prepared to drown, body and soul soaking from time to time and we'll never move the gravestones if we're not prepared to die and realize there are worlds outside the lines my God colors
fires outside the lines turns wounds to blessings water into wine we'll never walk on water if we're not prepared to drown body and soul need a soaking from time to time and we'll never move the gravestones if we're not prepared to die and realize there are worlds outside the lines oh worlds outside the lines god help us color with love outside the lines Good morning, BUC. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Paige and I'm the family ministry leader here. I'm going to share with you a little bit about this morning's theme and scripture before we dive into the sermon. Our focus scripture is Romans 12 and today it's all about love. It's a reminder that we are called to spread uh, love with one another. It's a reminder that God's love is always with us. It's a reminder that we are also called to love ourselves. Matt will be sharing what it means to be overcome with love and overwhelmed with fear. And we know that in the season that we're in right now, getting ready to go back to school, there are a lot of really big emotions and feelings, all the way from excitement and love to anxiety and fear and everything in between. I want you to know, however you're feeling right now about that, going back to school, those feelings are valid and those feelings are important. I want to share a quick little exercise with you um, that you might want to do, whether you're a student or a teacher or a parent and feeling overwhelmed um, with a big emotion of anxiety, fear, or excitement. Sometimes we need to come back to our body. Sometimes we need to show our body some love so that we can continue to share that love with ourselves and with each other. So this might be helpful for you and you can put it in your back pocket to come back to it another time, but this morning I'm gonna invite you to do it with me uh, from home. So I'm gonna invite you to get comfortable uh, and we'll take a few deep breaths together, breathing in God's love and breathing out God's peace. Breathing in God's love and out God's peace.
I'm going to invite you to notice, to pay attention to the senses and the things around you. I'm going to invite you to notice five things that you can see right now. I'll invite you to notice four things that you can feel or touch right now. And three things that you can hear right now. And two things that you can smell right now. and one thing that you can taste. So this is a little technique to bring yourself back to your body if you're feeling overcome with fear or anxiety or excitement or something else. We want you to know as you're preparing for school, however that looks like for you as a student, a parent or a teacher, an, a school staff, or someone who loves one of those people. We want you to know that BUC loves you, that we're here to support you, that we're praying for you. And on this coming Wednesday, we have um, an event called Back to School with Love, and we want to share and show that love to you. So you're invited to join us at the crossing, which is the front um, lawn of the church to receive a special blessing from myself and Matt and Katie and a special care package to help you navigate this new season, um, whether you're a student, a parent, a teacher, a school staff, or someone else, you are invited uh, to receive some love before the next chapter begins. So know that we love you, we are here for you, and we are praying for you. God is with you in this time. Amen. Good morning. I'm Darlene McDonald, and this morning I'm your reader. The reading is coming from the Good News Translation, and it's from Paul's Gospel uh, Letter to the Romans, I'm sorry, chapters 12, verses 9 to 21. Love must be completely sincere. Hate is what is evil. Hold on to what is good. Love one another warmly as Christians and be eager to show respect to one another. Work hard and don't be lazy. Serve the Lord with a heart full of devotion. Let your hope be, keep you joyful and be patient in your troubles and pray at all times. Share your belongings with your needy fellow Christians and open your home to strangers. Ask God to bless those who persecute you. Yes, ask him to bless, not to curse. Be happy with those who are happy, but weep with those who weep. Have the same concern for everyone. Do not be proud, but accept humble duties. And do not think of yourself as wise. If someone has done you wrong, do not repay him with the wrong. Try to do what everyone considers to be good. Do everything possible on your part to live in peace with everybody. Never take revenge, my friends, but instead let God's anger do it. For the scripture says, I will take revenge and I will pay back, says the Lord. Instead, the scripture also says, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them drink. For by doing this, you will make them burn with shame. Do not let evil defeat you. Instead, conquer evil with good. Well, good morning, Bedford United Church. Uh, my name is Matt Fillier, and I'm the lead minister here at BUC. I'm on the screen, and I'm also sitting in the pew or in the chairs or behind the organ or somewhere today. Uh, I'm laughing because today is our first uh, in-person watch party 
So there are people in church today watching our premiere video together as a community, including me and the rest of the staff. And there are also, of course, lots of you watching online on Facebook Live. So hi to everybody. And I never thought I would welcome myself to worship from a pre-recorded video when I'm in person in worship at the same time. So tick that off my bucket list. All right. Who would have thought that ministry would be like this, right? And that brings me to my question. You know, we're about a week from going back to school. Who's feeling overwhelmed, right? Who's feeling overwhelmed? Um, I, I definitely have my moments as a parent. You know, I th it wasn't that long ago, and we were grieving the early end of the school year and all the changes that was going to bring to our summer, and now it's almost September. And there's definitely excitement, I know for me, let alone for Isabel and, and for Lorna too, about school starting up. And there's also a kind of grief, right? Because the way we're going back to school is different. And the way that we're going to be schooled together is different, right? It's not like any September I've ever known, right? And it is overwhelming. The, the fear, the stress, the anxiety, you know, the frustration, the unknown. It really is a remarkable time to be alive, right? Um, and it is genuinely overwhelming at times. And, you know, I'm reminded by Paul's letter in, in Romans today that, yes, and we will be, and we have been, our ancestors have also plenty of times, human beings are overwhelmed with fear. And the Spirit calls us to overcome with love. And that's good news. We can overcome with love, right? You know, if we wanted to shorthand what Paul wrote today, we might say, don't let the crisis take the Christ out of you. Don't let it. It's there. God is here all the time, right? Even in the midst of all these transitions, take hold of that as you move into those times where you really feel overwhelmed. And that's kind of what we're going to explore today. And it reminds me of a wisdom story I wanted to share with you. Love this story. So it goes like this. Um, you know, once upon a time, there was a village. And the village fell into really hard times. And no one knows how or why or when it started, but people started arguing with each other and bickering and fighting, and there were rumors, and there, were, there was rivalry, and it was just the villagers stopped caring for one another, and they also stopped caring for the village. And the village looked like it was going to fall into ruin. And this broke the village elder's heart, right, who just did not know how to get the village back to a time of peace and harmony. And, you know, travelers, when they were coming by the road, they would just take the long way around this place. They would not go through there. It was a bad scene. Until one day, this, this stranger, though, shows up and sees the state of the village and makes a beeline, like on a mission to go find the village elder and says to them, sees the pain in their eyes and says, you got to tell me this story. How did this happen? So they have a very serious conversation. And the stranger thinks about this and says, you know, I think there's a way for you to redeem and restore your village. And the elder's eyes just open at this and go, well, out with it. Like, what's the secret? And the stranger says, well, there's, there's not a secret. It's just a fact. One of you is the Messiah. <laughs> right? And the village elder is just like, okay, I just poured my heart out to you. And, and this is what you've got for me? Like, are you, are you serious right now? You know, as they say in Cape Breton, you can go pound sand, says the village elder, and, and just, you know, takes off down the other end of the street and leaves the stranger behind. And, and the elder's just, you know, humored maybe by this, also kind of upset, of just like, this is ridiculous, right? Bumps into their best friend, and the elder says to the best friend, can you believe this person? Like, this is the advice they had for us. Like, how, how, how beyond is this, right? And the friend hears it and laughs about it too, but, but then tells another friend. And then, you know, two people tell four people, tell eight people, and on and on it goes, right? You do the multiplication. Everybody in the village ends up asking this question, wait a minute now, what if one of us is the Messiah? Well, then the real game starts, which is, of course, everyone trying to figure out who is it, right? So when you're walking down the street and you see the kids in the playground at school, people are asking, is it one of them? Is it the neighbor's kids? Are they the Messiah? You know, you're on the bus and you're looking at the people on the bus and people are asking each other, is it, is it them? Or, or are they the Messiah? 
You know, the, the two neighbors who just erected the giant fence so they didn't have to look at each other, who spend all of their day in front of the municipal bylaw council complaining about the existence of their enemy across the way, right? They start asking, my enemy is my enemy? Could they be the Messiah? It changes how people live in the village. There starts to be this attitude of reverence for each other. You know, and, and they start to live like a people with a common purpose who are seeking something really precious together, and no one ever quite knows if that treasure is right in front of them at any given moment or not. And that changes everything for them. And this community spirit just bubbles up and over, this energy that people are just so attracted to, they come from near and far, because it's so rare, they wanna be a part of it. You know, and the stranger doesn't have to come back because they don't have to come back. You know, I know, I know a church is kind of like that, actually, in lots of ways, <laughs> right? And you might hear that story and go, Matt, that's nice, but it's make-believe. Like, what about the real stuff we're facing today? Well, I think that's, that's real, what that story says. You know, we're a community that, that uses this word namaste quite a lot. And, you know, I hope we're, we're not using that because it's cool or it's trendy or it's an interfaith kind of word as well. I think we use it because we genuinely believe that it's important to ask the question, what if God was one of us? It's kind of a question that Christianity brings with it, right? That changes the foundations of everything. Is that what we mean by honoring the spirit in one another, right? I think it's part of it. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful way to live, right? If we take that seriously, that's incredible. I think that's real. You know, and when we talk about make-believe, like lots, lots of people watching this right now are going to say, yeah, but Matt, the, a lot of the Bible's make-believe. Come on, it's, it's make-believe, right? It doesn't get much more real than what Paul's talking about in Rome. It's got to tell you, you know, this is Rome under Nero, historically, the Emperor Nero. Um, these are really violent, dangerous times for, for Jesus believers. There was no Christianity at this time. It's the early church, right? So there are different kinds of movements within the Jesus tradition, right? As, as people who think of Jesus as the Messiah in this time in history. And let, let me just paint a broad picture for you. It's a really scary time. You know, people have lost businesses. They've lost uh, their houses. They've lost a way of life. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Um, it's, it's a scary time inside the church. There's a lot of tensions. And then there's this massive tension within Roman society about these Jesus believers too, and Jewish Jesus believers as well. Like it's a whole thing. You think our committee meetings are interesting. We don't know the half of it for our ancestors. Um, it's, it's real. It's real what Paul's talking about. People are very overwhelmed by fear and anxiety and stress and violence and persecution. You name it, right? And Paul says, and we've got to overcome with love. Right? That's, that's the journey of the Spirit. That's the journey that village took as well. And in a way, like if you look at what Paul wrote, that's what the village did. If you could paint with Paul's words, that would be the painting. It would show you how that village lived out its life, I think, in a very real way. And when you look at Paul's letter today, I mean, it's so beautiful. And there's a couple things to say about it before we, we jump into it. I want to ring a couple bells real quick. When Paul talks about hating what's evil, remember something, right? In his time, the thought that starts in the heart has a physical manifestation in the world. It becomes a choice or an action, right? So when Paul says, you know, hate what's evil, look at the actions he outlines then and what follows. There's nothing about violence or hurting people or condemning people. It's, it's all the exact opposite. I mean, even to the point where Paul says, don't worry about vengeance, okay? If that even exists, that's for God to look after, that's not our stuff. We, we don't got to worry about that. This is the way that Jesus calls us to live. Focus on this, right? You know, when you, when you get into talking about it, if you did all the steps that Paul outlines here, like, wouldn't this be like the perfect life of faith? It's, it's like a recipe, isn't it? Like, don't we just follow these 10 steps and then we live without being overwhelmed anymore by fear? Paul doesn't say that, right? In fact, a recipe is a really bad analogy for Paul. Like, I think what he would say to us is, when we think of a recipe, like think of your, like, <laughs> think of your grandmother's, your great-grandmother's amazing bread recipe. You follow all the steps on the cart. You do all the things that it says to do. And it's supposed to turn out perfect. 
I don't know about you, but even when I follow the recipe lots of times, it doesn't taste exactly the same. It doesn't turn out exactly the same. Sometimes it turns out quite miserable, right? For reasons beyond my control, right? It's not just always about following the recipe. There are all these other factors at play that we can't control. And I think that's, Paul's not talking about that. It's not about being perfect. It's not about living in a way so that you will never be overwhelmed by fear. We're human. Life is wild and unpredictable we are going to be overwhelmed. That's just the way it is. And we can overcome with love. So I think what Paul, really a better metaphor for him today for us to think about is Paul saying, like, love is like an art, right? Think about what love is like as an art, not as a recipe where it's always the same, but it's an art. You know, you've got to study art. You've got to spend time training with other artists. You, you're going to want to look at art, at great practitioners of art, the art of love, and see what that looks like and experience that. You're going to want to take your art to places in the world where it's really needed, where it can be inspired, where it can be seen and experienced. You know, you're going to want to cultivate the sacred fire of art in your, in your soul, right? The hunger for creativity and exploration and pushing your limits and practice, 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 right? All of that, love and faith are like an art for Paul. And that's really what he's saying here. He's acknowledging that, like, he even says in the letter, like, look... You can live this way, and despite your best efforts to live at peace with everybody, you're probably going to get into conflict, right? That's not unavoidable. Like, it's, it's not an either or. It's a both and. You will be overwhelmed by fear, and you can overcome with love by living this way, right? This is the mark of someone who is living a spirit-led life. And, you know, when I think about love as an art, like, I just look at the world, you know, turn on your computer, turn on your radio, look at the TV. It is overwhelmed with fear right now. As people of faith, we've got to show the world how to overcome with love. That's our challenge. It's my challenge. And when I think about taking Paul seriously, I think about this example. Uh, this is a practical one, okay? It's, it's not <laughs> world-changing or anything. But I think sometimes these are helpful. When I think about what Paul wrote here, you know, I was at the hospital one day going to see someone and I walk in and there's this huge lineup, right? And Because there's only one desk that's open for doing the COVID questions and everything. And there's the poor guy who's behind the desk. Let's call him Jim, okay? His name tag says Jim for this story, all right? And he is just swamped. I mean, people are hot. They are frustrated. It's like 35 degrees outside. Everyone's gummed up in the hallways there. They're uncomfortable. They're panicking anyway. They just want to get to their appointment. And you can feel it. Like even me, I'm looking at my watch and going, how long is this going to take? I really need to get to see this person. There's so many other things waiting for me today. I just, like, why aren't, why isn't the line moving, right? You can feel this energy. And I, I remember watching this one person come up to Jim. Hey, this, this guy just cursed him up one side and down the other. I mean, it was like appalling to me to hear this. And it kind of knocked me out of my frustration with my watch and thinking about time and stuff. And I was, look, I saw Jim, you know, and going, wow, like this guy is really taking it today. This is brutal. So when it's my turn to come up to the line, you know, I walk up to the wicket window and Jim is instantly like, like this, right? And that's the fight or flight response. He's pushing back from the wicket window, not because... I'm this big scary guy and intimidating or anything, but he's ready, right? Someone else is going to come at me today and give me something, right? They're going to be mad with me. And in the midst of it all, I just looked at him and I said, you know, Jim, how are you doing today? How are you feeling today? And, you know, he stopped what he was doing and he took a second to collect himself. And he's just like, man, you have no idea. You know, I'm not even a volunteer. I actually work in another department in the hospital, but this person called in sick today and, and someone's got to do it, right? So I'm here and this is what's going on. Like you could not pay somebody enough to put up with what I'm putting up with today. And I was just letting him vent, right? And when he was done, I, I said to him, Jim, I just want to tell you, thanks for keeping me safe. Thanks for keeping these people safe, even if they're not thankful for it, even if I'm not always thankful for it. I really appreciate what you do, and I know it's really, really hard, and it's really, really important. And, you know, it's not like it saved the day. He was so thankful, you know, with me for, for saying that and taking the time to have that conversation with him. And some of the people behind me heard it, right? Lots of people are still frustrated, 
but a number of people behind me heard it and they changed their tune as well. And you know, the best part of it was the security guard overheard this and then of course put a call in to say, we need more people, like we need to move this along for folks, which was really great and great for Jim. You know, but you think that's just a practical little example, but think about that. I mean, that's what Paul talked about today in a very simple way. Like, what if we lived as if we want to honor the Spirit in somebody else, as if the Messiah was one of us? How would we want to treat that person? Well, we would bless them, not curse them, right? We would welcome the stranger, not chase them away or be frustrated with them. We would, you know, rejoice with them and weep with them depending on how they're feeling. You know, we try to live in harmony with, with each other. We try not to be wiser than we were. You know, we wouldn't repay anybody evil for evil. We'd want to try to do what was noble in the sight of everyone. Um, <laughs> these are all the things that we would do, right? And, and this is a simple everyday thing. And I don't do this nearly enough. And what would, what kind of village would we create if we could apply, if we could paint <laughs> With this kind of paint that Paul's got for us in the palette today, what would the village look like? What kind of scene would we be able to, to paint for, for people? I think it'd be incredible. And we can. And, and this, is, this is a scene that doesn't, doesn't pretend that we won't be overwhelmed at times, that, we, that we're not you know, somehow going to be able to avoid that. That's true. That's going to happen. And... This is why we're a community and a church together, to remind each other of how to also overcome with love. And you know, I'll just close with this. It's amazing to me that, uh, you know, on Wednesday next week, you know, Paige and Katie at our church, uh, two of our amazing staff members, you know, they were overcome with love and their volunteers around them were overcome with love. And there are these beautiful, uh, you know, uh, what would you call them, care packages that are going out, you know? Uh, a total blessing to families going back to school. And I remember seeing Katie made this invite on Facebook to say, hey, BUC makers, could you help put face masks, you know, into this? And here are these people who really are artists, right? Fabric artists who said, yes, we can. You know, those people are overwhelmed with, with fear and all kinds of stuff going on in their lives. And yet they also overcame with love. And they poured their love in these beautiful masks that are going to go back to families and students like, and that's just one part of that story, and there's so many people involved. That is beautiful. Like, what kind of village do we create? What kind of painting do we create when we really treat love as an art, when we remember that we will be overwhelmed with fear and we can overcome with love? When we say to one another, hey, BUC, in all that's about to unfold in the weeks to come, don't let the crisis take the Christ out of you. Here's to that. And all the people said, Amen. And friends, the spirit in me honors the spirit in you. Take care. I call out 
Fun we have Christmas play, sleepovers. I go to Sunday school and I really like cooking in the kitchen. As we all say, all are welcome all the time. Um, that's, that's huge to me because I feel like everybody, when you walk through the door, everyone's happy to see each other and um, they embrace you and welcome you and um, it feels like a, it feels like family. We also enjoy seeing Isaiah grow spiritually. I mean, I think it's it's fantastic. Uh, it's not a prescription. It's uh, it's an exploration. We give um, monthly donations. We make sure we budget uh, the money that is donated to the church. There's times you go out shopping and you buy something and you have regret. Well, I find the investment here is never a regret. We're always happy to, uh, you know, give financially and our time. It's it's important to us uh, to be part of the community. It's like a household. We're all doing our part. Yeah, we want the church to continue, and the only way it's going to continue is if if we put our time and um, contribute whatever we can. Sometimes people can't afford much, so even a little bit really makes a difference, but we want the church to exist in the future. For example, we haven't been here for two months, <laughs> so I got a bank draft done up today at my work <laughs> to make up for the two months that we weren't here because I kept thinking to myself all summer, we don't have car yet. It was really important because we weren't here for two months, so our money wasn't going into the church, so I had to make it up for it at the end. A whole bunch of people go here and more friends are made every day here. To keep these programs free and uh, enjoyable for everyone so that everyone is welcome, it's, it's so important that uh, we contribute what we can. We budget our money so that money was already there and we make sure that we set an, uh, enough aside that's reasonable so that we can still take care of our own bills but also take care of our church and our community.
still and know that I am God. Be 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 still and know that I am God. In you, O oh God, do I put my trust in you, O oh God, do I put my trust in you, O oh God, do I put my trust? Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Creator God, during this pandemic, we've had some time to contemplate the wonders of your world, to sit on our doorsteps marveling at the plants and flowers around us, or feel the pull of the ocean, the sun sparkling on the waves, the sound of the water lapping on the shoreline, the comfort in knowing that some things remain the same. But at the same time, we are fearful of what is happening to the patterns of our lives and what lies ahead Never have we had such fears of what the future holds. We know that you are here with us all the time, but we need your help maintaining our faith. There are many within our BUC community who are suffering in silence, feeling isolated and alone, while others are fighting life-threatening diseases amid this pandemic. Beyond our own community, People are trying to cope with combating violence, discrimination, questionable leadership, and natural disasters. So often we ask ourselves, what can we do? Help us to remember that you are always here. And if we have faith, there is hope for the future. As Paul encouraged, may we overcome evil with good. May it be so. As we leave this service, we extinguish our candles and go out into the world seeking justice and respect for all people. Jesus came bringing us hope. Jesus came bringing us hope. Jesus came bringing us hope, hallelujah, forevermore. Jesus came bringing us hope, Jesus came bringing us hope, Jesus came bringing us hope, hallelujah, forevermore. Joy, Jesus came bringing us joy, Jesus came bringing us joy. Jesus came bringing us joy, hallelujah, forevermore. Sing love, Jesus came bringing us love. Jesus came bringing us love. Jesus came bringing us love, hallelujah, forevermore. Love, Jesus came bringing us love. 